groups today, all currently working on VCH projects. We have Simon Townley, County Editor for VCH Oxfordshire, Francis Borman of VCH Middlesex, and Diana Newton of VCH Durham. We also have two guest speakers. First, David Killingray, Emeritus Professor at Goldsmiths and Chair of Trustees at the British Association for Local History. David is a, an active participant in the VCH and he's also a member of our advisory board for the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. And we're hugely grateful to have David's talk today on an issue that's so important and urgent for us, particularly I think in light of events of the last couple of weeks, how to work towards more inclusive and diverse local histories in our research. Our second guest speaker is Matt Shaw, the IHR librarian. Matt and the IHR role library team have provided loads of resources to support researchers, to support historians during lockdown. And he's going to share some advice, some guidance and resources on that today. You'll have seen today's programme on that opening slide. First, we're going to hear from each of our three work in progress speakers. During this time, you can share comments in the chat box, but please don't paste uh, questions for the speakers there um, during the talks. Once we get to the question and answer session, which will be after the three initial talks, there are two different ways you can ask a question. First, you can type your question into the chat box. That should be what you can see at the right hand side of your screen. If it's not there yet, just go to the bottom of the main screen and click on chat and that should appear. Make sure that you address your question to everyone so that we can all see. Or if you would like to speak yourself, you can raise your hand virtually and we'll come to you and take your question. The way that you do that is go down to the bottom of the main screen, click on participants, Another panel will appear on the right hand side and that should give you the option to virtually raise your hand, then we can come to you and take your question. So I've suggested you leave your chat box open throughout the event, we can share comments here, you may see um, URLs or other details of relevance, but we won't start taking questions from the chat box until the Q&A session, so please don't type them until then. We'll have further Q&A sessions after each of our guest speakers, David Killingray and Matt Shaw. We've got a tight schedule to stick to. So two and a half hours is kind of pushing at the limits of stamina for an online event. So we're all going to do our very best to keep to schedule and keep to time. Finally, you'll be glad to hear, we would really welcome live tweeting from this event. So if you are that way inclined, please use the hashtag virtual VCH and if you like you can use the Twitter handles for the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community and the Victoria County History. You should be able to see those down in the chat box now. We'll endeavour to retweet everything and get the conversation started for people who aren't here in the room with us today. So I think that's enough of the, the introductions and the housekeeping. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Simon Townley is the Victoria County History County Editor for Oxfordshire and he's going to speak to us on work in progress, Victoria County History work in progress on the Chilterns. Thank you very much Simon if you want to share your screen and take over. Right, thanks Catherine. Um, right, has that come up? Can uh, perhaps yep, Catherine or record? Yeah, good. So. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Uh, welcome, everyone. This feels a bit weird, but um, weird is the new normal. So, um, Yes, as Catherine said, this is the first of a strand of, of work in progress uh, and obviously um, a fairly tight schedule. So uh, it's going to be fairly summary. Um, basically, Oxfordshire has a couple of big red book projects um, uh, in train at the moment. Uh, having got our Witchwood Forest volume out last last summer. Uh, one is looking at the area around the, the market town of Chipping Norton uh, in West Oxfordshire. Um, and that work in some ways has been the uh, the work hardest hit by archive closures because it was at a, 
uh, a fairly early stage and uh, we're all keen to get back into the archives. Um, the other one uh, is at the other end of the county, work on the South Oxford to Chilterns. Um, and that uh, is much more advanced. This is a volume that uh, we're hoping to submit for peer review next month actually, uh, and that we still hope is gonna uh, appear at the back end of next year. Um, and because the research stage for that was uh, uh, by and large complete, uh, we're still hoping to, uh, to stick to those schedules, which uh, in some ways has become even more important for us now than it perhaps it was six months ago. Um, and to give you your bearings, I'm gonna start with a map, which is always a good way to start. Um, so we're down in the extreme southeast of the historic county of Oxfordshire, um, an area bordering Berkshire and Buckinghamshire. Um, it's uh, fundamentally the area you can see um, uh, encapsulated within this large southward loop of the, uh, of, of the River Thames. Um, it's an uh, entirely rural area. The pirate parishes were actually looking at for the forthcoming volume, um, but uh, fringed by the market towns. Uh, this is where I'm sort of reaching uh, automatically for my red pointer, and of course I haven't got one for this. But anyway, over on the, the west, you've got the, the, the ancient market town of Wallingford, uh, actually historically in Berkshire. Um, on the east, Henley-on-Thames, uh, which was actually covered in a previous Oxford BCH volume a few years ago. And down to the south, just across the river, uh, Reading. Um, and uh, about 50 miles downstream, off to the right, London, uh, of course, which uh, had a marked effect on this area uh, economically and in many respects socially right through uh, right through from the Middle Ages to, to the present day. Um, so that's the area, uh, just to fix it geographically. Um, this uh, actually is a map in progress and it needs a bit of work to make the boundaries stand out a bit more clearly. But I hope you can all see that it's uh, an area uh, dominated by these long, thin strip parishes, uh, which for the most part extend uh, sometimes five or six miles from the river uh, up into the Chiltern uh, Hills. Uh, you get some idea of the topography from the, uh, uh, the relief shading there. Um, so the, the parishes on the west uh, extending up the Chiltern Scarp, uh, those on the uh, to the south east at the, the dip slope, but a very, a very similar pattern. Um, and this is a pattern which uh, really has its origins in the, uh, the creation of late Anglo-Saxon estates uh, round about the, uh, the 10th century. Um, we can actually see this happening in, in some of the better do documented places, uh, places like Newton Murren. Um, but it's certainly a pattern that's well established by the time of Doomsday Book. Um, uh, and this period of transition, um, certainly in Midland England, a process that's, that's very well recognized now across, uh, across very wide areas, uh, these new estates replacing an earlier pattern of more extensive lordship uh, focused on places like Benson up to the north, which again, we covered in an earlier volume, uh, possibly, possibly goring. Um, but this great change in landscape organization in this area um, it's not just a matter of, of landscape reorganization and boundaries on a map. It's, it's part of a much uh, larger uh, social uh, change and economic change in the late Anglo-Saxon period. Um, the creation in effect of, of these new estates being given to uh, a new emerging saintly class of almost a sort of proto-county gentry who were uh, very often um, establishing new uh, proto manor houses for these new estates and very often founding their own local churches uh, often uh, next door to them uh, again this is part of a much much wider and quite, quite well-known pattern um, but it's one that we can see happening quite clearly in this area I don't know if you can see even on this map uh, by and large there are exceptions and exceptions are always interesting um, but by and large the churches uh, are grouped down by by the river uh, very often with a, a, an adjacent manor house uh, next to them. Uh, this is one example, this is Newton Murren, uh, <coughs> which stands out quite nicely. So you've got the, the river over on the, uh, on, on the west there, 
uh, you've got the church uh, ringed in red and the former manor house uh, immediately to its north uh, ringed in in yellow. Uh, here the actual village has, has migrated for reasons I haven't got time to go into but uh, uh, you've still got the the early nucleus there of the, of the manor house and the church which is uh, as I say quite a, a common pattern. Um, by the 13th century, uh, this as I say is an exception because of village migration, uh, but by and large by the 13th century most of these early nuclei are accompanied by uh, uh, nucleated uh, villages down by the river, uh, but it's a very long drawn out process uh, that's only happened between the 10th uh, and 13th centuries and sometimes later. And when it comes to work on individual places, that's uh, something we're trying to sort of put more, more flesh on the bones. But of course, as always, some places are better documented than, uh, than others. Um, in terms of this process though, um, because of the nature of these, these long strip parishes, um, it's, it's really um, a process that's only affecting one little bit. You get the emergence of these small nucleated villages and churches, to say often down by the river. Um, but you've got the parishes based on these late Anglo-Saxon estates stretching uh, often many miles uh, across very, very varied landscapes up into the hills. Um, and that's clearly part of, it, it reflects the, uh, a process of, uh, of clear planning when these estates were first being created, uh, giving each of them a, uh, uh, a, a mix of landscape types and uh, a, a mix of agricultural uh, resources. So by and large in most of these places you get a pattern emerging of uh, nucleated villages and churches by the river, uh, very often open fields uh, on the, uh, the lower slopes, but then merging as you get onto the higher ground into a very, very different landscape of uh, scattered, dispersed settlement, isolated farms, clusters of houses, uh, very often grouped around greens, commons, uh, ponds, uh, water supply on the uh, on the hills often being a problem into into modern times, um, uh, all intermixed amongst uh, private hedge closes uh, and areas of woodland and wood pastures. So it's a it's a very radically different landscape. And although this 18th century map isn't all that clear and doesn't uh, show open fields, for instance, I hope it gives you some sense of that that transition. Uh, of the landscape into the uh, into the uplands. Trying to reconstruct the settlement pattern on the, the higher ground in particular um, can be quite a tricky business and it's uh, it's often very fluid and very dynamic. Uh, I mean, nucleated villages of course change in their essentials but by and large um, you know we know that there's perhaps a village there by the 13th uh, century. On the uplands things are, are much more fluid and much more changing. One way in is um, analysis of uh, tenant by names uh, as they're recorded in the, the early Middle Ages, 13th, early 14th century, uh, many of which are topographic uh, and actually relate to some of these outlying sites. So you find people, tenants sometimes named perhaps in the in the 13th century, say in the hundred rolls, um, whose name is actually taken from one of these outlying sites on the hills, uh, some of which still survive as, as, as outlying farms and, and, and farmsteads even, even now. Um, conversely, you get some of these outlying sites which were named from medieval uh, tenants or, 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 or owners or freeholders. Um, and again, sometimes they still exist and the name uh, still survives. So this is a, a place called English, uh, up on the Chiltern Hills near, near Nuffield, um, several miles from the, uh, uh, well, the now vanished village, but the church and the early nucleus down by the river. Um, the English family were actually freeholders, um, recorded uh, in Newnham Murren in the, uh, the 13th century, who uh, built up um, a moderately sized freehold up in the hills, which survives, it becomes a reputed manor in VCH parlance, uh, but it remains a separate estate and farm uh, right down until modern times. Uh, and it's, uh, let's say, the name reflecting its 13th uh, and 14th century uh, owners. Uh, um, the house there as it now exists, um, this is uh, built with slave money I'm afraid, which is particularly 
topical in the light of, of, of recent events, but the owners, the Dottin family, owned a couple of large plantations in Barbados um, when they were rebuilding the house in the 18th century. Uh, rather chilling to look at their wills and find them uh, uh, quite literally bequeathing their Negroes along with their other property in Barbados. Um, but anyway, uh, it's, it's actually a much more complex house than it looks from the outside. It retains uh, fragments of a late medieval timber frame core, and it's a house we've been able to look at in some detail with uh, our friends in the Oxford Buildings record. So uh, uh, quite a lot about this site uh, and its history in the building in the, uh, in the forthcoming uh, volume. Um, but the other thing about uh, uh, this disparity between the lowland and the upland, uh, again, it's not just a matter of landscape organisation because it raises very interesting questions really about uh, people's sense of identity and belonging in these large uh, parishes. Um, one parish with a church theoretically at one end, but I think one of the broad questions that we've been looking at in looking at all these uh, the, the, these places is the extent to which um, some of these upland communities, uh, whether we're talking about the 13th century or the 18th, uh, developed their own sense of, of upland identity, uh, which cut across the, uh, the sort of parish network. Uh, and to a large degree, that seems to have been the case. Um, it's obviously a very different thing, to, uh, different a uh, difficult problem, difficult question to try and get a handle on, but there are ways in. Um, certainly by the time you get to the 17th, 18th century, social connections visible in, in wills, for instance. Um, uh, another way of getting at it is uh, questions of religious affiliation and religious identity. Uh, it's quite clear that some of these upland families um, actually uh, attended uh, um, much nearer upland churches where they were able. Uh, we find this, it's quite well documented by the 18th century when we find um, uh, clergy uh, complaining about this in visitation returns. Um, but it's something that's also happening earlier as well, and we do get hints of this. So the, the people living in English, for instance, the medieval English family and their successors, forging very strong links with the uh, uh, the close of the village of Nuffield and the church there, right through from the Middle Ages through to the 18th and early 19th century, rather than with much more distant uh, parish church down by the river several miles away. Um, but uh, it's a complex issue, and of course the upland and the lowland uh, weren't hermetically sealed, they never have been, they're uh, economically, socially, topographically very closely interconnected. Uh, the open fields on the lower ground, the shared woodland and wood pastures on the, uh, the higher ground are, are shared resources uh, which are being um, monitored and regulated through the mechanism of the manor court. So you've got these sort of different identities pulling in different directions, but it's, it's, it's a key question to try and address uh, for, for the area. Um, the final strand that I just want to draw attention to in this area very, very briefly is the gentrification, uh, which transforms the area, uh, particularly from, uh, well, from the mid-19th century. Uh, it's a process that accelerates with the arrival of the railway, the Great Western, Western Railway, the extension from London through Reading uh, and beyond, which basically runs uh, parallel to that loop of the Thames that you saw on the on the Berkshire side, with stations at Reading, at Pangbourne, near Whitchurch, um, and slightly later at Shiplake. Um, and this starts to accelerate a process that we see slightly earlier with uh, wealthy incomers, often with London connections, uh, moving into the area and starting to build uh, grand uh, villas and detached houses uh, on the fringes of some of the larger uh, riverside villages. Um, this uh, actually nicked from Google uh, is uh, an area between Maple Dunham and, and Durham and uh, Cabersham. Uh, you can see some of the grand Edwardian uh, buildings that are lining uh, some of this area, which has a transformative effect on the area. Uh, and it's also part of a much larger process of demographic change from the 19th century, uh, which 
uh, affects some areas more than others, um, but it's reflected uh, in the late 19th and 20th century in a wholesale redrawing of parish boundaries uh, to a degree which is actually quite unusual in rural Oxfordshire. Uh, and this, uh, again, this map is a work in progress, uh, but you can perhaps see the extent to which the earlier pattern of those strip parishes has been completely obliterated and the colour coding um, is uh, an attempt to relate some of those changes to, uh, to demographic change, to uh, population density uh, as, um, uh, as, as recorded in the 2011 census. Uh, and you can see it affects riverside places, but you've also got uh, upland places, uh, what have been small heathside settlements that have uh, in some instances developed into uh, quite large uh, focuses of population um, from the late 19th century and into the 20th, places like Somming, Common. The most spectacular uh, example, and this is the, uh, the, the, the last point, down at the bottom towards Reading, uh, there in yellow, very high population density. And that's Caversham, which historically was just another of these long strip parishes, a rural place, but from the 19th century starts to get swallowed up into Reading uh, as Reading expands, particularly with the coming of the railway, uh, and is now basically, or it's the southern part of the ancient parish, a very densely uh, settled suburb of Reading, which was taken into Reading Borough formally in 1911, uh, and has a radically different character from uh, anywhere else in that whole area. Um, that, as they say, is another story, albeit one covered in the forthcoming volume, but I think I'm just about out of time, so I'll leave it there uh, and try and unshare my screen so we can move on to the next one. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I should say, for anyone who wants to show their appreciation to our speakers, again, if you go down to the, the, middle, uh, the, the middle of the screen, down at the bottom, there's a reactions button and you can give a virtual Round of applause like that, or you can say thank you very much, Simon. Great to see that that work in progress, and and I was particularly interested to to hear those insights about English farm and uh, uh, the, the the background in the, the the slave money and the Barbados plantations. There obviously will connect with a, th a thread we'll be coming back to later in in our event today with David Killingray's talk on diversifying local history. Something to to, to keep our attention to. Um, so Francis, I'll invite you to start setting up your screen share now. Thank you. Um, Wonderful. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Francis Borman. Francis is an Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, and he's also an author for VCH Middlesex and has really been driving VCH Middlesex over the last few years. He's going to speak on a really intriguing topic, I can't wait for this, the curious case of Shepherd's Market, Mayfair, the Mayfair, and St George Hanover Square. Over to you, Francis. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, welcome everybody else. Um, so I think my talk is probably going to contrast a little bit with the last one in that it's uh, much more focused on modern history, uh, much more focused on urban history, and is also a bit more localised. Um, my work in progress is a short book on the parish of St George Hanover Square in Westminster. And the civil parish was only uh, actually created in 1725 and then abolished again in 1900 to be replaced by the city of Westminster. Uh, this is obviously a modern image of London, but it shows uh, where the borders of the parish would have been. It's bounded in the north by Oxford Street, uh, with the wider northern sections made up of Mayfair and Hyde Park, which you can see marked on the map. In the south, Belgravia and Pimlico run down to the Thames, approximately bounded to the east and west by the Lost Rivers of the Westbourne and the Tyburn. Now, St George's includes some of the richest areas in London, and landmarks include Grosvenor Square, shown here, which was the centrepiece of 18th century development in Mayfair, but also the white stucco of Belgrave Square, built in the early 19th century under the management of Thomas Cubitt, who oversaw the construction of much of Pimlico II. Uh, Cubitt, however, was just the developer and it was the Grosvenor family who owned most of the land, as you can see from this map of Mayfair borrowed from the Survey of London. Um, the, the Grosvenors owned 
very much the larger part of Mayfair um, with smaller estates, uh, Conduit Mead to the east owned by the city, the Barclay Estate and Dean of Chapter of Westminster uh, further south. Um, but then also south from there, um, the land owned by the Curzon family, um, which is what I'll be talking about today. And I really wanted to focus on a less well-known area of uh, Mayfair and of St George Hanover Square, which is Shepherd Market. And that was nestled behind the huge buildings you can see here, fronting onto Park Lane and Piccadilly. Uh, so over on the right hand side of the picture, uh, possibly covered by uh, a few faces there, there's a kind of cluster of uh, smaller and more densely packed buildings. As you can see, Shepherd Market had a very different character uh, to much of the rest of Mayfair. Um, but also quite a different story from more famous parts of the parish. Um, but this is one which was woven into the wider development of Mayfair, uh, which I'm hoping to show today. So this map of 1682 uh, from the excellent layers of London, um, also under uh, the same institute as Victoria County history, shows Piccadilly, which was then called Portugal Street, um, and the line of grand houses just on the northern side ends with Barclay House, which was then the westernmost point of the built up area of Westminster. Uh, further west from there, uh, there were mostly open fields and also Hyde Park and in Great Brookfield, which is very near Hyde Park Corner, an annual fair was held for 16 days from the 1st of May, with the first three days dedicated to live cattle and leather. Ready-built shops were available, which you can see here, and they were let to tradesmen, while visitors could enjoy, according to an ad of 1804, the same entertainment as at Bartholomew Fair. One Mr Pinkman both offered a performance from atop an elephant and took inquiries for stalls and booths. This was the Mayfair, uh, which would later give the entire area its name. Attempts were made to suppress the fair in the early 18th century, uh, with a presentment of the Grand Jury of Middlesex describing, to quote, a notorious assembly of dangerous, loose, lewd and debauched people of both sexes, which uh, you can see in this crowd here. Uh, the land unoccupied by the fair was laid out for building in 1721, and though the fair continued, it was confined by the encroaching urbanisation. Grants for a cattle and sheep market to take place twice a week in Great Brookfield were made by James II. The rights for these passed to Nathaniel Curzon, who petitioned Parliament with John Kent when the City of London attempted to have them suppressed, fearing competition. The city's efforts seemed to have been successful, with no further mention made of the market in the early 18th century. However, the right to hold a market in Brookfield on Mondays, Wednesdays and Saturdays was reconfirmed by a grant of 1740, allowing the sale of any food, including flesh, fish, fowl and herbs, save for live cattle, grain, bread, corn, seeds and hides. And this was obtained by Edward Shepherd, whose new market building was planned for opening on Michaelmas 1741. So Shepherd was a builder and architect who had worked on the Grosvenor estate and had other developments in this area, including his own house. It later became known as Warncliffe and then Crew House, pictured here much later, of course, um, but was probably built in 1730 and then rebuilt following its sale in 1750. Shepherd's House is marked here on Roke's map of 1746. Shepherd also leased land from Nathaniel Curzon to the north of the market and fronting onto Curzon Street in 1740 and further land on the east side of the market in 1742 subletting some to build up Shepherd's Court. However, he mortgaged land and the rents from the market to pay a debt of £1,250 in 1744. Shepherd died in 1747, leaving his land to his wife Elizabeth Shepherd. Elizabeth continued her husband's business, leasing further land from Curzon in the same year that he died. Following her own death, various inheritances were disputed in the courts. But the estate continued as a going concern and granted building leases to William Vale during the 1770s to build housing north of a new street to be called Shepherd Street, also forming East and West Chapel Street, either side of the Mayfair Chapel. 
The Mayfair Chapel illustrates the somewhat insalubrious character of the area and its complex relationship with wealthy neighbours. The chapel was built in 1730 and the clergyman Alexander Keith established a lucrative trade in clandestine weddings there, sometimes attracting nobility wishing to marry outside their class, as with the second Duke of Chandos and his bride, the former chambermaid Anne Wells, whom he reportedly, although I suspect this was an, ap an apocryphal tale, purchased at an inn. Keith was sued by the rector of St George Hanover Square and committed to the Fleet Prison, though his assistants continued to perform marriages at his house near the chapel until the Marriage Act of 1753 put an end to the possibility of clandestine weddings. In the later 18th century, respectability was slowly taking hold in the area. Local residents petitioned the vestry to suppress the Mayfair in 1763, and when the Earl of Coventry moved to Piccadilly, he uh, added his clout to this campaign and hastened its abolition the next year. Dissenters became more prominent around the turn of the century. A small religious society was formed around 1795 and used various private rooms for worship. Their numbers were increased by the closure of a Baptist chapel towards the eastern end of Piccadilly around 1798, and they established the Ebenezer Chapel in Market Street, Shepherd's Market, opening in 1801. The church was recognised by the Congregationalist Union in 1803, and growing attendances encouraged expansion of the chapel early in the century. Also from 1823, houses were registered by Wesleyans in Shepherd's Market until at least the mid-century. A Sunday school was held in an independent chapel from 1816 and by 1838 had 12 teachers and an average attendance of 90. Reconstruction in the 19th century created the buildings still present today. Shepherd Market itself was partly rebuilt around 1840, followed by the main block in 1860, though it still suffered from snobbery. In 1867, Shepherd Market was described as, quote, an elysium of retirement for prudent footmen and upper housemaids into the genteel chandler's shop or greengrocery business, although market is a sad misnomer. Edward Shepherd's house still stands, though much altered, as the Saudi Embassy, one of very few 18th century London mansions to survive in any form, let alone with its grounds intact. And you can see the leafy front garden there, um, which was the forecourt of Shepherd's house uh, back in the 18th century. The market area itself is now a mix of quirky shops and restaurants, including the only mixed Polish-Mexican menu I've ever encountered, and is much less stuffy than the grander neighbourhoods nearby. And I'd thoroughly recommend a visit, uh, of course, once we're all out and about, and it's safe again to do so. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. That was terrific. And again, if uh, you want to uh, show your appreciation to Francis with a uh, the reactions button at the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much. And we've put in the chat box some links to the Layers of London website that Francis referred to, um, where he took some of those map layers from. I have to say that the Mayfair sounds pretty fantastic. Mr. Pinkman on his elephant and all those uh, interesting ladies and gentlemen. Really fantastic topic. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to our final speaker in this part of the programme. Just a reminder that we're holding our questions for our three work in progress speakers until um, the end of this section, so after our next speaker. So it's a pleasure to introduce our final speaker um, on work in progress. Diana Newton is reader in history at Teesside University and she's a member of the Durham Victoria County History Trust. Now, one of the things I really like about the Victoria County history is you think you know the project and then you discover really surprising and innovative and creative and imaginative and fresh pieces of work going on all over the place. And what Diana is going to speak to us about today um, really, I think, exemplifies that kind of work that's going on in the VCH. She's going to talk about a really innovative partnership project involving the Victoria County history. And it relates to a little place that you might have heard a little bit about recently near Durham called Barnard Castle. So I will hand over to Diana. I know that Rebecca is going to share the slides via her screen. Is that right, Rebecca? So I'll give Rebecca a moment to get the slides up whenever you're ready, Rebecca, and for Diana to unmute herself, ready to speak. Whenever you're ready, both of you. Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, Diana, thank you. Good. Okay, shall I start speaking? And is uh, Rebecca going to show the slides? As a slideshow? Um, did you want to just wait and, uh, I think you wanted to give her a cue for the first slide, Diana, but she can move to that whenever you want. It should well, be she could, showing, showing she now. She can start with the first slide now. Okay, great. Okay, um, this, that's actually Rebecca, you can see, not me. Um, I don't know where I am. And given that I'm talking about um, advanced technology, you're going to lose confidence in me before I even start. Um, but anyway. We uh, can see you now, Diana. We've switched your video on. Have you now? Yeah, okay. we can see you. Right. You're with us. Okay, so uh, a, a little background. In, in 2016, the Durham Victoria County History Trust approached Teesside University about forming a partnership to advance the History of North Teesdale project by bringing together research already undertaken and ongoing by volunteers in two parishes in Teesdale, Middleton in Teesdale and Gainford, and to initiate a third in Barnard Castle under the guidance of a contracted historian to produce short BCH parish volumes. A point four project coordinator was appointed who was jointly funded by the trust and the university for three years under my direction. Now, whilst drawing up the tri legal tripartite agreement between the two partners and BCH Central, it struck me that we should also make volunteers' research available to local schools, and this formed part of the final agreement. The project coordinator and I went to pitch the idea to a primary school in Middleton in Teesdale, who asked for material about lead mining. And this was a fantastic stroke of luck because one of our volunteers had abundant material all about lead mining. The project coordinator and a student as researcher from Teesside University worked together with the year teacher using this material to put together a teaching package which more than met the requirements of the national curriculum in England's history programme of study at Key Stage 2. This is ages 7 to 11. That was a roaring success and it culminated in a memory cafe where pupils shared their project with other pupils and staff, school governors, parents and members of the community, as well as pupils from the little school up the dale who were bussed in. When we came to replicate the pitch at the primary school in Barnard Castle, the teacher happened to mention a recent school trip to the partially ruined castle in the town. And in case you've forgotten what it looks like since it dropped out of the news a couple of weeks ago, this is a photograph of a fraction of the castle with from left to right the round tower, the oriel window of the great chamber, windows of the great hall and the Mortham Tower. Hardly any of the pupils had visited it, which is regrettable, but one of the pupils had said how great it would be if he could hold up his mobile phone to see how the castle would have looked when it was complete. Now, I'm still terribly impressed by the electric kettle, so I have no idea whether this would be feasible, but when I went to the School of Computing, Engineering and Digital Technologies, computing for short, at Teesside University, they said not only was it, was it possible, but Teesside had the most cutting edge technology to achieve it through the application of augmented reality. Augmented reality supplements reality with virtual information superimposed onto the real world. And in the case of our project, what is there plus a digital recreation of what was there? And its big plus is that making an application using augmented reality available on mobile hardware, in other words, iPhone or iPad, puts the user in situ, thereby offering uh, the user a much more immersive digital experience than traditional video-based technologies. Because video-based technologies enable only a very passive engagement with the historical sites since they're limited 
by the distance of the camera from the buildings, which gives the user no control over their proximity to them. The augmented reality technology deployed, deployed by computing at Teesside offers the user both physically at the castle or remotely on a mobile device, a much more immersive digital experience. So next slide, please. Because the image, in this case, a section of the existing castle can be manipulated by either moving the iPad itself or even by physically moving around the iPad oneself. And I'm just beginning to get the hang of this. This enables a tailored experience so that a 10 year old or a teacher or an artisan could each focus on specific areas of the historic site that are of particular interest to them. And in turn, this naturally encourages active and proactive engagement with the built environment based on decision making, which puts the user in control, whilst also building on existing understanding and preconceptions, and thereby expanding knowledge in an entirely innovative fashion. So, the project began to take shape. The director and project coordinator of the Durham BCH History of North Teesdale project met the senior property curator North from English Heritage in whose guardianship the castle is, who promised unlimited access to the site, consultancy and access to documentation and other material relating to the castle held in the English Heritage Repository in Swindon at no cost to the project. Thereafter, the history section and computing at Teesside with the support of Durham BCH Trust and a generous grant from BCH Central, embarked on producing an interactive augmented reality application to create an historically faithful reconstruction of the inner ward of Barnard Castle, complete with internal as well as external depictions using the cutting edge technology at Teesside University. A team in computing implemented a base mechanic system working in 3D virtual reality or photogrammetry composed of hundreds of photographs and have, have captured 3D elevations of the existing castle walls through the deployment of drone photography in preparation for reconstruction. Now, since the castle is very close to a Young, young Offenders Institute, the police soon came along to investigate what the team were up to, but once satisfied they were engaged in legitimate activities, they actually closed the bridge for them to help them with their work. Next slide, please. The result included this view from inside the inner ward of the castle. In other words, at the same point as the first photograph, but from inside. So that in reverse order is the Morecambe Tower, the windows of the Great Hall, the oriel window of the Great Chamber, and just falling off the edge of the image, the Round Tower, all captured by photogrammetry. And these can be viewed either by the use of a virtual reality headset, which makes it possible to navigate one's way around the existing castle and makes you look like a Martian or a giant blue bottle, or on a mobile de device as already discussed. The interactive augmented reality application for use on mobile devices, iPhone or iPad, began by rebuilding the Great Hall and Great Chamber in the inner ward as it would have looked in around 1483. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the bits closest by the river with the oriel window um, of the Great Chamber and the two windows of the Great Hall between the Mortham Tower and the Round Tower. And so, in close consultation with English Heritage, reconstruction of the exteriors of the Great Chamber and Great Hall began. And if I can have the next two slides, one after the other, please. So there it is being uh, sort of built. I'm ending up with this rather Lego-looking building. 
but computing have since faithfully realized the exterior of the buildings as they would have looked in 1483 exactly what the schoolboy asked for and work on their interiors and the rest of the inner ward was underway and it was intended to launch the project product at the castle in the summer but sadly with the university in lockdown since the end of march and with english her heritage with other preoccupations the project has ground to a halt however computing did manage to download the augmented reality app with the completed exterior of the great chamber and great hall onto my ipad just before teesside university closed and it really is truly amazing uh, next slide please next slide is it there Sorry, it's got, not working. The last slide isn't there. Well, that's a shame because that's the Fiesta de Resistance. It's the actual castle itself, uh, the, the great chamber and great hall. But it is a faithful reconstruction. Um, and it, I was, was going to show you a still image of the two buildings, uh, but with the uh, app on my iPad in my hands, I can actually see the two buildings as they would have looked in 1483, superimposed onto the existing castle, and I can wander all around its exterior at my own pace and concentrate on what I want to look at. And I'd love to have shown you the app at how the app actually operates on my iPad. I had hoped I could show you a video of my husband, but I suspect that's not there either, is it? The little video? Um, I have got a, a short video, which I can try and share, that you sent to me. Yes, please. You can see that I'm the real technological wizard, this, aren't you? I think it's hair raising trying to deal with all this technology live in front of a large audience. <laughs> I'm terribly impressed with the, the cool calmness of, of both you and Rebecca. Well, I can't see anybody, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I was able to make it work earlier and I appear to not be able to do it now. It, 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 it really doesn't matter because what the video is is it, it me videoing my husband using the app on the ipad sort of sweeping around the inner the inner ward but again that is just a video um with ah okay can we can we do this now yes that's that's what you can do just holding it yourself uh, uh, sweeping around the inner ward back to and there we have it's gone again but there we have the image of the great hall and the great chamber but of course this again is a video of my husband doing this on the ipad with all the drawbacks uh, of the video uh, technology that i've described before because of course with the augmented reality app on your own ipad or iphone you are free to go wherever you like focusing on whatever you want to look at in your own time and eventually the whole castle its exterior and interior how it was occupied uh, what it looked like how people worked uh, and, and defended it will be rebuilt rebuilt exactly as it looked in 1200 1483 and 1700. Now, I just want to say a couple of words about the advantages uh, and of the package, which are legion. The experience of the visitor to the castle is enhanced immeasurably, making for a better appreciation of the true scale of the fortress and an understanding of its strategic, political, and social impact in the past. But it's much more than that. It also enables much more inclusive public engagement with the past by extending accessibility to include those living in low participation areas. 
who traditionally do not or cannot attend and visit heritage sites, or those with limited mobility who can be excluded from visiting such sites by making the package available as an online resource. While the introduction of a virtual and augmented reality experience for use in schools, colleges, universities, libraries and museums stimulates educational interest by facilitating a deep and informed involvement with the past through interactive engagement with historic buildings. And it's all thanks to a 10 year old pupil at the local primary school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. That's absolutely terrific. Let's show our appreciation uh, for, for Diana and thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, I should say that if it's, um, if it's easier for people, um, if you're seeing a gallery view at the moment, you can switch to a speaker view at the top right of your screen, which gives you a clearer view of the person who's speaking. Um, really terrific project. And I think what really strikes me there as well, Diana, is that you've talked about the, the rich different applications of that augmented reality technology when you're visiting on site. But I think um, lockdown has helped us all to understand other applications of that too, ways of accessing events when we can't be there physically, um, you know, in virtual experience of historic places so so much um, potential thank you very much Diana and can I thank all of our um, first three work in progress speakers for um, keeping brilliantly to time for fascinating presentations and also for just contending so valiantly with the technology this is a huge learning curve for all of us um, uh, and I think everyone has done really well <laughs> lots of technologies on the go at once um, okay, we are now going to start moving to our first question and answer session. So I've opened discussion in the chat box if people would like to post questions there. You can also ask a question by going down to participants in the bottom panel and raising your hand. Um, that will open up in the right hand panel. If you raise your hand, we will come to you and you can ask your question on camera. So if you have a question for any of our first three speakers, do you type that into the chat box or raise your hand? And we will take as many questions as we can in the time that we have available. So I, in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for people to type their questions in, can I open with a question for um, Simon? And this is thinking ahead to, to the point of connection between what you were reflecting on in your children's work in progress and what we're going to hear from, uh, from David Killingray um, later today. Can you tell us about the kind of sources that you use to recover that that slaving history of the, of the Dotton family of English farm. You referred to wills. Were those the key sources that you used or were there other documents that you looked at too? Um, those were the key things. I mean, actually, they, um, the, the Dottins turned out to be quite well known. I'd never heard of them, but they turned out to be quite well known and quite well sort of documented family in terms of uh, uh, sort of histories of slavery and, and some sort of obscure works on the, on, on slave plantations in Barbados. Um, I mean, they're not, they're there for about a century and they sort of feature in the way that landowning families often do and there's a lot about them. But uh, yes, I mean, this, this sort of sidelight on the money coming from slave who came at, uh, almost by accident really, through, through, through the usual sources and the wills uh, certainly fill in a lot. Um, I mean, as with so many of these families, of course, you you get a, an idea of the sort of role in local society. And um, they were clearly at the time, you know, quite highly regarded within the, you know, the sort of the, within the locality, mm. um, you know, being, I mean, not on a Colston scale, but they, you know, they were sort of philanthropic and very much part of the local gentry scene. Mm. Um, and you get you got all this going on in the background, um, which, as I say, you know, from a lot of the sources, you wouldn't even know. It mm. is, you know, you, you just look into their background and see where the money came from. It's fascinating that the way this happens sort of off stage in a way, isn't it? We were talking yeah. in the, the central VCH team just yesterday, but we were, we were making that comparison with Jane Austen's Mansfield Park and the way, you know, Lord, uh, Sir Bertram's kind of uh, 
work and 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 activities and and, and slave owning i guess out in the plantations isn't addressed directly it's kind of off the page and i, I suppose having to read into those gaps and silences and omissions in the sources is, is something really important i'm sure we'll we'll return to that that's great. I'm going to come back to you in a moment with another question, Simon. But first of all, I've got a question from Julian, which is for Francis. Um, so Francis, Julian's question in the chat box is, when did Shepherd's Market get its reputation as a centre for the, for the sex trade? Can you answer that for us, Francis? I think I can give a partial answer. So uh, it was certainly at points during the 19th century, kind of associated with a, a sort of fairly upmarket um, sex trade. Um, it, as a, a slightly poor area fringing Mayfair, um, there was that kind of reputation for um, uh, being able to supply uh, escorts to the, uh, the kind of rich and, and famous uh, denizens of um, the richer streets in Mayfair. Um, but I think really at the time there was probably less of a strong association than that built up in the later 20th century. I seem to remember there was some sort of scandal involving Geoffrey Archer um, where an escort um, was uh, said to be procured in the, the Shepherd Market area so I think maybe that has kind of retrospectively uh, pushed a little bit more of uh, that kind of um, association um, back through the ages so it didn't come up quite as much uh, as far as I've seen so far in the 18th and 19th centuries. That's fascinating. I feel that for the purposes of putting this recording up on our centre website, which is our plan, I should just say the word allegedly. Um. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Francis. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here in the chat, and this is from Rosalind to Diana. Um, and this is a question about the, the app at Barnard Castle. So Rosalind asks, are there plans to extend the app to include the stories of individual people, real or imaginary, I like that, who lived or worked at Barnard Castle? Diana, can you answer that for us, please? Absolutely. I mean, the, the possibilities are absolutely endless. And I don't think we need to include any imaginary people. I think there are, there are so many uh, exciting stories connected with Barnard Castle. One in particular that, that I think is particularly interesting is that uh, when the castle was besieged in, in the 1569 rebellion, uh, Sir George Bowes, who was holding the castle for the crown, actually complained that the, the biggest drawback of, of uh, uh, holding the castle when it was besieged was that he actually had to water his wine, which uh, he thought was a, a rather dismal thing to have to do. But interestingly, Barnard Castle was the centre of the biggest or, or the most extensive number of injuries in the 1569 rebellion, which occurred when the people who were holding the castle were actually jumping off the castle walls to escape, breaking limbs and uh, some people actually breaking necks. Uh, and I mean, to, to reenact that would be absolutely terrific. But that, I mean, I, well, obviously not with people actually breaking limbs and necks, but I'm sure if we, we could augmentedly imagine this. Uh, um, and in fact, there, there is, I, I can't remember what they're called, but it's something like they're called bobs or something. And these are people that you can actually uh, manipulate and move around the castle. But I mean, that's just one incident in its, its sort of 800 year uh, history. And I think you're absolutely right. It would absolutely bring it to life, having people doing things in the castle. Yeah, I mean, I think the way you're you're reanimating the site in terms of the building, as you say, you can just extend that into thinking about, uh, you know, re-inhabiting it as well. And I love the way that the Augmented Reality Project, it's really all about the kind of intersection between all the underpinning research and the technology, but also the creativity as well. It's a really creative project, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yes. More than the electric kettle. <laughs> Definitely more exciting than the electric yeah. kettle. Thank you very much, Diana. We have another question here from Chris for Simon. Now, this is really interesting because I think it gives us an insight into some of the challenges in Victoria County history research today. In the Victoria County history, we, we um, parcel up our research by ancient parish boundaries, but sometimes places have changed a great deal and that can be quite difficult for us today. So Chris asks Simon, how do you research and write the modern history of Caversham which you told us is now really a suburb of Reading, without doing the history of Reading. That must be something that you've had to think about quite carefully. Simon? 
Yeah, I was just trying to work out how to answer that, you know, in a box. So I'm glad it's easier to answer it this way. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly, you've got to be completely make yourself as aware as you can of the sort of background of what's happening in Reading. And fortunately, there are some very good recent studies of, of Reading and its 19th and 20th century development. And uh, we also have close links with, uh, you know, local historians have been involved with that. Um, so while being aware of, of that context, the important thing is to keep it in perspective um, in terms of, you know, how it affects Caversham, um, which, as I say, develops as a suburb with a quite distinctive character. Um, very much more socially mixed, actually. I was talked about the gentrification, but even from the late 19th century, uh, you're getting some of these people coming into Caversham. Um, but it very much develops as a, as a sort of work, lower middle class and working class suburb uh, as well. Uh, a lot of people, I think about half the population actually working in Reading by um, around about the turn of the century, about 1900. Um, and as Stephen Mileson, my colleague, who uh, did a brilliant job of, of dealing with this in the in the draft, uh, mentions this constant flow of uh, people across uh, the bridge. It was a rickety old uh, wooden bridge. Uh, this constant flow of people going across into Reading and, and coming back um, in, in the evening. So yeah, I mean it's. It, it's tricky, but obviously what we're concerned with is uh, the development of, of Caversham and, uh, and, and its southern part. So as, as with so many other things, you've got to have the wider context in, in mind, at the back of your mind, and show that you understand the context without getting sucked into all sorts of extraneous detail. Mm. Thank you, Simon. And I, I think while well, 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 we have you here in the speaker screen, I think David Killingray has a question for Simon. David, um, do you want to ask your question? Have I understood correctly? Do you want to ask your question on camera? If so, can you unmute yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon, thank you. I wondered when the Duttings disposed of their Bajanist plant plantations and whether you have any evidence for the reason for that financial move. They clearly are not there in the compensation um, documentation that Nick Draper has worked on. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> sorry, I don't know is the answer. I mean, they disappear from um, uh, from our area. They sell up and move elsewhere in the, uh, the late 18th century. Um, and uh, well, I, I wasn't the one who actually worked on, on I that parish, see. but I, I don't think they're. Uh, a subsequent history has been followed up. I will um, pursue it for you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I mean, my colleague Mark Page is the one who wrote that parish history, yeah. and I, I don't know whether Mark's participating in the conference, but uh, he he may have more. He may have more information. Great, and I'd like to point out if anyone hasn't seen already in the chat box, people are very generously sharing um, wider knowledge on this topic, some really useful links like to the Legacies of British Slave Ownership database, references to, um, to abolitionists, for example, in BCH volumes. So lots of really useful links and references to follow up there. Um, I think that's all our questions for the time being. So what I'm inclined to do, I think, is to move on with our programme, which will then give us scope to, to have a more leisurely question and answer session later and maybe draw together some of what we've covered in today's event later on. So we will um, move on at this point. Thank you very much to our first three speakers and to everyone who's answered questions and shared comments in the chat box. Uh, we will move on to our two guest speakers. Um, that's good. I was slightly worried that David was running away there, but he's back. So we will move on to our two guest speakers. And these are topics that I hope will be of use and importance to all of us working in um, local and regional history and place studies, as well <coughs> as history more widely. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce David Killingray who is Emeritus Professor at Goldsmiths, Chair of Trustees at the British Association for Local History. Many of you, um, of course, will know David's work, um, which is very wide ranging. It spans 19th and 20th century African and Caribbean history, and also English local history. So a real expert in our field, but there's also a lot in David's work that I think we can learn from in our practice. 
in the VCH, we're committed to developing our work on diverse and inclusive histories. And this is also a really key goal, a key ambition within the IHR strategy for the next five years. And I think the events of the past, uh, the past week, the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations over the last fortnight, uh, the toppling of statues of slave traders in Bristol and London, they underline, don't they, just how important it is for us to look with renewed attention at our sources and to do justice to the past. So I know we'll be able to learn uh, an awful lot from David today in his lecture on rereading the sources and diversifying local history. Thank you very much, David. I know Rebecca is going to share the slides. So when you're both ready, thank you very much. I'm ready, thank you. The events of the last two weeks have vividly demonstrated the responses of many black Britons to their place in Britain's history during the past 400 years. So I'm very grateful to the media for widely advertising the focus of this talk, which is twofold. First, that all localities exist within a larger whole, or as Jack Simmons put it 70 years ago in his inaugural lecture at the University College of Leicester, local, national and imperial history. His ethnic vision may have been blunted, but his point is valid. Some communities might have had little contact with the vast world beyond their boundaries, but I doubt if there were many such Every soldier returning from a foreign war, I think Martin Gere, had a story to tell as every sailor home from sea. Likewise, the marriage partner from another parish and the itinerant beggar whom overseers returned to the parish of origin. And prayers were said and collections taken in many 18th century English parish churches to redeem local people in captivity in North African Bar Barbary states. Second, that after 1550, England and Britain's fortunes were increasingly tied to an expanding overseas trade and a growing empire. Central to that endeavor and to metropolitan fortunes by 1750 was the transatlantic slave trade. This brutal business enriched investors as you'll see on the map coming up and then the following map to follow. Enriched investors and slave labor put sugar on tables, coffee in cups, tobacco in pipes and cotton on the backs of Britons. As you'll see from the first uh, slide, you've got the beneficiaries of the slave trade who live within uh, five or six kilometers of where I live in Seven Oaks in Kent. You have a cluster of houses along the Vale of Holmesdale and also up on the North Downs, which is into the northern um, section of a rather poor map, I'm afraid. The consequences, the next map shows the number of people in um, Kent who were beneficiaries from the compensation scheme in the 18, late 1830s and 1840s about 400 people actually who benefited from it. So the slave trade and its consequences are pervasive. A consequence of this contact with a wider world was a steady stream of people of African origin and descent who settled in Britain. By 1770, Britain had an increasingly diversified population, a visible minority of probably 10,000 people half that number living in London with small black communities in Bristol and Liverpool and several thousand others scattered in every county from Shetland to Cornwall. Now it's roughly the same pro proportion in ratio to the population in 1770 as was in Britain in my younger days in 1960. So that gives you some idea of the visibility of black people, particularly in major cities like London, Bristol and Liverpool. The racial diversity in British localities is reasonably well documented. However, locating it requires rereading familiar documents with a different agenda in mind. The kind of site required by historians in the past who focused on the working classes or women or children 
and other groups of people who'd been ignored or marginalized by history. Let me come to the, th the third image, and if you could put that up, Rebecca. And it's an image, an advertisement in the Postboy of the 4th of September, 1707, for the return of a Negro boy. This is typical of many of the advertisements, and there's a project at the University of Glasgow that has collected them. They raise interesting questions, both about individual circumstances and about wider communities and their complex depictions. First of all, who was Prince, the object of this advertisement? Did he have another name? How did this black youth get to Kent? And what was his status in the town of Deal on the coast? Why did he run away? What can be inferred from the references to his scarred body, his belongings, and of course, his master? Broader questions arise about the na nature of labor relationships 300 years ago, and how many other black people were living in East Kent at this time. Importantly, when we look at this document, there is no firm evidence in the advertisement that Prince was enslaved. And to read it like that is to misuse documentation. Certainly a handful of black people in 17th and 18th century Britain were referred to as slaves, having been brought into the country by colonial planters from the Americas, who often continued to treat them as such. And yet English law was ambiguous as to the status and rights of black people in England, particularly if they'd been brought into the country by their owners from colonies where slavery was legal. The issue of ownership and deportation would not be resolved in England and Wales until the Somerset case of 1772. So while this snapshot of a runaway youth in Kent bears much in common with thousands of other adverts placed in newspapers around the British Atlantic world, which aimed at the recovery of fugitive people of African origin, including the enslaved, it is no less suggestive of a runaway apprentice bound by contract, in other words, signed indentures for several years, to a master from whom they absconded. And the next two slides, the first one which comes from Domestical Law of 1622, gives you some idea of how uh, the law viewed those who were servants in relation to masters. The next slide shows you uh, an account from a brief line from uh, the will of Thomas Papillon, or Papillon, uh, a crease in East Kent. He says of his black servant, I take him to be in the nature and quality of my goods and chattels. That sounds like the language of, the sla of slave ownership, but it does not necessarily imply that. One has to be careful. Indeed, public notices similarly worded were printed about white runaway apprentices, which provided details of height, age, physical features, and the clothes worn as a cr crude means of identification. Like white apprentices, Prince had few rights, and the very clothes he was wearing probably belonged to his master, so that by taking flight, he was legally guilty of theft. Whatever his origins and his precise status, the advertisement is a telling reminder that young black people were working, traveling, building networks, and seizing opportunities in early modern Britain. Now, many black people in Britain worked as servants such as Prince, the runaway black. Uh, I live in Seven Oaks and the large house of Noel, which is in the next image, was home to two blackamoors. They're in the household inventory between 1613 and 1624. They were resident there. And I often wonder whether they came into the parish church where I worship regularly and attended divine service. But there are many other examples. You only have to go into uh, even an average uh, good art gallery to see paintings by Nella and Hogarth and Zoffany and by unknown artists, which include, as the next slide does, a black coach boy. This is from Erdig Hall near Wrexham, roughly 1720. But if we turn to diaries, John Baker's diaries, John Baker from 
Chichester in the 18th century. There are frequent re references in his diaries to his slave. He calls him a slave, Jack Beef. In fact, Jack Beef is given his uh, freedom just before he's due to retire to the Caribbean with a pension from his owner. So that says something about the ambiguity of even of slave status within Britain. Black servants are also memorialized um, on gravestones and even in modern roads. And the next one comes from uh, um, Ramsey's servant. Ramsey was the abolitionist uh, rector of Teeson in Kent. And this is a recent development called Nestor Court. And Nestor's grave is in the local churchyard and also in the, um, on, on the wall of the church, a plaque to him. Now, some of the black men who came to Britain were seamen, many being itinerants. But John Anthony, a black seaman, was a resident in Dover in the second decade of the 17th century. It's not clear whether he was born in England or had come to these shores from Africa or the Americas. Certainly he was a sailor on the pinnace Silver Falcon that sailed to Virginia in 1619, returning with a cargo which included tobacco. Anthony was paid like his fellow white seamen, and when his wages were not paid in full, he boldly petitioned the aristocratic financiers of the voyage for his dues. That he was paid them and with interest is recorded in state papers. There were many black sailors and soldiers, their images sometimes in paintings or in, for example, the next slide, which is a bas relief from the foot of Nelson's column. No one's crying to pull this down, at least I hope they don't, because on the far left of this bas relief looking down Whitehall, and the next slide shows it in full, is the is um, a, a black seaman who is pointing out where the shot that uh, has mortally wounded Nelson has come from. If we go to the next image, we'll see that there are other sailors. This is the Greenwich Hospital. Uh, it's in probably 1840s, 1850s image of um, people in the hospital. And it, there is a black seaman with his medal. And if we go to the next one, it's a painting by the Scottish painter Wilkie. It's a rather poor image, I'm afraid, but it, it shows the news of Waterloo coming and centers of the in the picture is a black soldier. So the evidence of black people in all sorts of walks of life is uh, there to be seen. You merely have to have uh, a different agenda as you walk into an art gallery or look at a book or a diary or whatever. Many black people were artisans, coopers, masons, carpenters, bricklayers. One exceptional example is William Cuffey, and he's in the next slide, born in Chatham. And this is his father's marriage certificate. And the next one shows Cuffey, who is a tailor. He's a political activist, a chartist, and he was charged with treason in 1848 and transported to Van Diemen's land. But a good number of the people who came to Britain came for purposes of education. <clears throat> and this starts in the 18th century. They come from the Caribbean <clears throat> and from Africa. And secondary education is in private schools and at English and Scottish universities. And so educational records, both of the, the big private schools, so-called public schools, and the universities are an invaluable source for checking out. Here's one from <clears throat> a college for training people to serve as uh, Christian um, agents in uh, overseas. And right in the center, we've got Jeffrey Nkopa. He's uh, um, from the Cape in South Africa. And he played cricket in the, uh, uh, the fields of Kent in the 1890s. <clears throat> The next image we've got is of some schoolgirls in a school up the road um, half a kilometre from where I live. And there you can see two in the back row and one in the second row seated. The three daughters of Grenfell, the Baptist missionary, by his Jamaican wife, his second wife, Rose Edgerly. And 
They're not only photographs in the school, but they're records of them. Young people were also brought to Britain by travellers, missionaries and benefactors for good or ill. And here's an example in the next image. And it comes from a, uh, a painting by Cope on the uh, west wall of the church at Shoreham in the Durrant Valley. I can just about see it from my study window if I was 60 foot tall. And you can see in the carriage that is being hauled up, there is um, Cameron who has just walked across Africa looking for Livingstone who wasn't lost. And behind him is Jacko, his black servant, who is a deaf mute. And he continues to live in the village. He plays cricket in the village. He's in the 1881 census register. But there are also professional occupations in medicine, law and the church and in school teaching. The next image is of um, uh, the entry of Christian Cole for an Oxford college. If you can bring that one up, Rebecca, is it coming? Um, no, it isn't. The next one, please. Sorry, that's, we'll forget that one. And then you can see his name at the top, Christian Frederick Cole, it is. And in 1878, he's the first known African, not black, but African graduate from Oxford in law. But there are also black clergy serving in English parishes. And the next one um, relates to a man called Brian McKay. And this is uh, an account by William Holland, Holland, who meets him and says, I met today young McKay, I suppose his name incorrectly, who is come to see his sick father. The young man is his son by a Negro woman. And then he concludes, I'm not partial to West Indians, especially young Negro half-blood people. It's uh, not a very nice comment, but it's not an uncommon comment. But there are others. There are people like Archibald Hewan, doctor, missionary, naturalist, GP in a well-heeled part of West London in the 1870s. And the next image shows the Reverend Dr. Theophilus Scholes. There he is in the back row with the Edinburgh Missionary Society, goes out to Africa. And when he does return after some two periods in Africa, he begins to write books, which are still worth reading, although a bit uh, overwhelming at times, on uh, denouncing imperialism and racism in the British Empire. But there are also um, uh, authors, and one that is well known, of course, is the next image, and that is uh, Olidar Equiano, a book published in two volumes in 1789, self-published and promoted by him. There must be, I suppose, oh, well, I have in my database over 150 books written by and published in Britain alone by Africans between uh, 1770 and 1950, in other words, before the post-colonial literature boom. And they range widely from um, memoir, novels, poems, music, um, travel, books on law, ethnography, and so on. Let me conclude. What is the significance, the impact of black people in Britain? Black people coming to Britain enjoyed freedom not available in the colonies in the United States. In the UK, they were subject to the rule of law. They had the right to live where they chose, work, enter the professions and marry anyone whom they fell in love with once that person fell in love with them. And they could vote if they were qualified by gender, income and property as a good number were. The first known black uh, voter is in Westminster, a fairly liberal uh, constituency in terms of the numbers who are on the voting list, but that's in the 1780s. For most of the period under discussion, that's before 1948, the visible minority of black people were accommodated into the white host communities. I don't use the word integrated, but I think accommodation is the best term to use. It's important to see race relations for much of the period under discussion within the context of contemporary social class systems. Of course, it cannot be divorced from attitudes to black people shaped by slavery, 
pseudoscientific ideas of race, which boomed after the 1860s, and the upsurge of imperialist thinking in the decades after the 1870s. Black people's experiences serve as a mirror to racial attitudes. And we can perhaps see this by intermarriage. The next slide is, I hope, one which comes from, no, sorry, this is Emily, who's a, 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 a very good violinist and who's a musician. This is the one I want. The marriage by license of Peter, the black servant to General Rochambeau, to Suzanne Parker in Morton Hampstead in Devon. The bells rang merrily all day, says the diary entry. The first Negro to be married in Morton and the whole turn town joined out in the celebrations. What does that say about race relations in this small Devon community? And if we look at the next image, it shows um, uh, a marriage in 1906 between Thomas Bren Wilson and his uh, future wife. And you can see it's a very mixed uh, race structure. You've got a black person almost every other in between every white or the other way around. Um, what does this say? Um, what can we read into black clergy in the Church of England being in rural parishes? I mentioned Brian McKay. He's vicar of Coates in Gloucestershire from 1799 to his death in the late 1840s, so for 50 years. But he's not alone, and there are others who were uh, um, black clergy and held positions in English parishes. And when we go to another interesting development, and that is looking at congregationally organized um, churches, Baptists and congregational. And there you find that there are people who were uh, um, uh, ministers called by the local congregation to serve them. And that surely says something about race relations within um, the community. Let me go to the next slide, please. It says something also about political activity, and this is the Pan-African Conference that met in London in July 1900 mixture of black and white women from around the uh, globe. Um, but really rather important um, in many respects. And if we go to the next image, this is something which resonates today. It, it's a report produced by the League of Colored Peoples formed in 1931, but it was produced in 1944 with money that they provided from a trust to look at race relations in British schools. The argument being, and you've heard it advanced by numerous black speakers on the television in the last two weeks, that if you're going to change people's attitudes and ideas and extend their knowledge, you need to have a proper curriculum in the school. This document was arguing this in about 60 pages in 1944, um, surprising that it is not been brought out and dusted down again because it still has something to say that is valid. The next slide will take us, I think, to uh, an issue which is a major issue in 1945, 46, 47, that's Britain's Brown Babies. And this is a recent book by Lucy B Bland. And she has tracked down these children. So it's a, a splendid piece of social history at the local level. And when I went to the launch of the book, I sat next to a man and he opened the copy of the book that I had and he said, look, that's me. And there was something really exciting about going to this book launch and meeting all these people who'd been invited by Lucy to come and share in the launch of their book about their experience 70 years ago as small children. It's not often that children get noticed in history, but it has in a very vivid way. These are the brown babies that were born as a result of the largest um, incursion of black people into Britain, uh, black GIs, 120,000 of them during the Second World War. And I think the last image, I hope it is, yes, these are most of them ex-servicemen who'd served in Britain during the war 
and who returned to Britain in June 1948 on the Empire Windrush. That's 600 of them. And uh, what I've been talking about is the period before 1950. And most people, I think if you go and talk to them, and I've even well-read people, would say, were there black people in Britain before 1950? I thought they all came on the Empire Windrush. No, they didn't, and they're here. And what I've talked about is this long period which deserves to be sought out, analysed, and where appropriate, included in studies of local history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we can show our appreciation for David using the reactions button uh, and a round of applause. Um, thank you, David. Uh, uh, a timely and important um, talk, really um, pertinent to what we're trying to think about in fresh ways and think about how we can do better in the Victoria County history. What I was really struck by is um, the point that you're making that this isn't about um, magicking new sources from somewhere. This is about often looking at very familiar sources, but with new eyes. And I love the way you showed us details from parish records, some ephemera, from art, that wonderful detail on Nelson's column, which I'd been completely unaware of, and showed us how these traces and these stories are all there in plain sight. We just need to be looking for them. And I think this is something as historians, the um, the lives of people of colour in Britain before 1950, I think we are starting to become more aware of that through landmark books like Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors, and this is clearly something um, for us to, to develop further in the future. I have questions I would love to ask, but I can see questions already coming through um, in the chat. So um, we'll start with a question um, from Alex uh, to, uh, to you, David. Now, this is something that I think we'll, we'll, we can reflect on a little bit now. It's something, Alex, that I think we're going to need to grapple with at more length um, in the VCH beyond today. So Alex's question is, how do we incorporate black and minority ethnic history into our traditional Victoria County histories within the existing framework? So he comments on the approach you've taken here, David, noting the presence and lives of individuals that works well for rural parishes. But how do we do that for larger communities, especially for towns with strong colonial links like Cheltenham? How do we do justice to that history in those kinds of communities mm. within our standard VCH framework, especially before 1841? That's a big question, David. And I realise that this is a, a lot of it, it's to do with kind of the constraints that we currently work within in the VCH. But do you have any thoughts on that? I'm not talking about, and I have been talking about what I, what some people would call black British history. I've been talking about British history. And fundamental to that is the very strong belief that what we're talking about is people who are integral to British history. And if you ignore them, I mean, we did this in reverse in Africa. And if you, the books that I was brought up as a child, uh, uh, although the vast majority of people in Africa were, were Africans and there were a handful of whites, the focus was on the whites. And if you read the histories of the time, it was a bit like going to the theater and watching a few actors um, who provided a bit of the uh, dialogue or rather a monologue um, but ignoring most of the actors who were not allowed to appear on the stage or were mute. <clears throat> and I think that is the problem in a way with um, black people in British history. I think you have to treat them as just ordinary people who lived, happened to live here. And they did exactly the same as their white neighbours. And they're often um, accommodated or integrated within communities. <clears throat> a majority probably 70% in the 18th and the 19th century are men. And therefore they tend to marry local white wives. And that means that they are part of, as Bren Wilson, that photograph, I mean, he's part of a, a, a white family as well as a black family. Um, it is a challenge, I think, but I, I, I think just saying this is normal. Uh, 18 months ago, I put in the library here on behalf of the local history society um, a display of two boards with references to the presence of black people in seven oaks and this was a small town of five to ten thousand in the 19th century 
um, from the period 1600 to before 1940, 1950. Two boards and I, it was full of preachers and doctors and surgeons and um, uh, thieves and uh, servants and artisans and so on. Um, and this is assiduous collection, I suppose, looking in the right direction. Um, I once went to Margate Library and I said to them, what do you do for Black History Month? And they said, nothing, there were no black people here in, in history. So I sat down in the library and in two hours from their own shelves took down three pages of notes, which I typed up and sent to them and said, this came off your own shelves. And it comes from school registers and school magazines and newspapers and so on. The very obvious sources that we all work on. And I see those people as being incorporated into British history. So I don't see it as a big problem. You just treat them as people who appear. And if they have something exciting and interesting to say, or an experience which is notable, then note it. That's really interesting, David. Thank you. And I think one of the things that has been discussed in the VCH in recent years would, would be, for example, introducing uh, more more prominent sections on migration history in some of our volumes but I'm, I'm really struck by what you're saying that actually maybe this isn't something we need to address by scaffolding our volumes in new ways but just make sure that throughout we are integrating and thinking about in a in a fully integrated way. I wanted to pick up on a, a comment in the chat box from John Chandler and this is actually something that I'd noted to mention as well John thank you um, which is that in the VCH sometimes some of these these topics have been explored but in a slightly more kind of ring fenced and separate way. So there is a really excellent <laughs> volume that was published as part of the Victoria County Histories England's Past for Everyone series that some of you will know, um, a study of ethnic minorities in Bristol, um, 1001 to 2001. And that's really salutary, isn't it? Yeah. 1001 to 2001. That was published in 2007. And that's a really interesting volume one that in the team we've been revisiting in recent days in the context of events in Bristol. Um, but I think, as, as you say, David, what you're calling attention to is the need to incorporate that kind of uh, study and history into our standard VCH scholarship as well. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, David, we have a, a comment here from, from Jeanette, but I wondered if you might be able to kind of speak to this. So um, Jeanette, who's a, um, a research student here at the IHR, um, is working on the Foundling Hospital. Mm. Um, and she notes that when babies were first admitted, they were sometimes described in terms of appearance as a means of ident identifying them if reclaimed. Once receipts were issued for children, their appearance was no longer required. It's often other records that identify individuals of colour. A child who appeared in the runaway slave database and two parents who claimed a child because they were said to be going with the black people to Sierra Leone. So, does this, David, resonate for you in terms of kind of looking perhaps in the less obvious places or thinking creatively about the kinds of evidence that you can you can use to uncover these lives? I think some of these lives are found in all kinds of sources and I, I'm not sure that I would call the Foundling Hospital uh, an unlikely place to look at. I, I mean the kinds of sources I think yes, that was, that yeah, was misphrased. Yeah. I have on my file on my study floor, a, a fire which is about eight inches thick, and it's full of references to black children, because I'm rather interested in them. And my first interest was sparked by an exhibition that Bernardo's put in of their photographs. And this was done, well, it's many, many decades ago. So I've um, been collecting this stuff for a long time. Um, and it shows black children, and it would not, be surprising that there were black children in Coram's hospital in, in the late 18th century. Um, and that some of those may have even made their way out to Charter, Chartwell in Westford, which is not far from where I live, which was an overflow to Coram's hospital. Um, so that they would have been in the Kent countryside for some of the time. Um, now I think these, these kinds of things appear again and again. I'd like to talk to Jeanette sometime. And when I'm in the IHR, because um, we obviously share an interest. 
Brilliant. Thank you, David. Is that really um, for her question? I don't think I think it was a, it was a comment, but I, I was sure that you would be able to speak to it. Interestingly, I think that that is really helpful. Thank you. We do have a question here from Emma um, and she says the other imperialist countries of Europe have similar histories. Yes. How could local historians from different European countries link up together to develop better theory and practice of bringing BAME history into local history? That's a really interesting question, David. What are your thoughts there? Yes, uh, it, it's long been long my ambition. One of the areas that I'm interested in is the books that were written by, published by black people in Britain, many of them Africans, but also from the Caribbean. And uh, I've often thought that it would be great to have a European wide, um, uh, a collaborative effort in looking at this because something similar is happening in the Netherlands, um, in Germany and in France and Italy and Spain and Portugal. Likewise, um, young people being sent to school or people coming to study and from a similar directions, particularly from uh, for France and Spain and Portugal. Um, the uh, Congolese are going to train in Spain for the Catholic priesthood from the 17th century onwards. And travel across France today and you'll find plenty of parishes with African priests in them because they can't um, find enough French priests. I mean, na local native born people. So yes, it, it's, it's wide open. I'm afraid I, I am a monolingual illiterate. And so I'm, well, almost. So I'm stymied when it comes to dealing with these things. Um, but I, I'd love to see it happen. Hmm. It's a rich thing. It is, isn't it? And I think, again, that's something that we're very interested in developing further um, across the Victoria County history, that idea of kind of connected and joined up local histories in all kinds of different ways in relation to all kinds of different topics. And actually connecting up internationally is, is something we're, we're doing a little bit of work on at the moment, actually. So watch this space and see if something happens there. And this would obviously be a very productive and important theme to explore with others in other, um, in other countries. There's a question here uh, in the chat from Janice and she asks you, David, you, you were very careful in your talk, weren't you, about distinguishing between um, historical people of colour who were enslaved and those who weren't and pointing to those ambiguities. Janice asks, when do you think that the attitude to race became focused on the slave trade? rather than a wider view and she also observes that some of the terms that were used in those adverts um, for for runaways they reminded her of terms used for wives as well so it's a kind of maybe a bit of intersectionality there we're thinking yes, about it, gender mm, what mm. are your thoughts i tend to be influenced by books that i recently re read and I, I, I that's just a bad trait to have as a historian although i read them critically one book that i'm reading at the moment almost finished is by catherine molyneux and it's a very interesting book on the 18th century and it looks at um, the images which were produced in Britain about that were related to black people and it takes for example as, as a chapter on tobacco and the way in which tobacco is promoted and coffee and but also the images that were done uh, used and what artists like Hogarth and Nella um, and Zoffany actually meant when they put what was the point of putting black people in satirical paintings particularly children and i'm not sure that i appreciate all that she's saying or are terribly sympathetic to it but it does seem to me that it opens a door about how race was viewed uh, because i use the word visible and they are a visible minority unlike say huguenots or people from the low countries or uh, um, from germany white people who could pass until they open their mouths um, their dress didn't necessarily give them away. Um, but if you were black, uh, you could be as English as uh, your neighbour, but you were nevertheless black and therefore identifiable. So I think there are, there's a large volume of material in the 18th century that we need to investigate in, as, as Catherine Molyneux has done, in much greater detail to try and see where these images of um, uh, race consciousness and once you've got that what do you actually do with it I mean how do you analyze it and interpret it it's not merely saying it's there 
and it was written about or but how did people view it and that is a very difficult thing to to capture i mean it's clear that a large number of black people went to churches um and i'd love to know what their fellow congregants or parishioners thought of black people who came um we don't know but we don't know very much about what 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 white people did in church let alone what black people did so you there is a problem there but we'll keep chipping away at it thank you thank you i mean i think there are loads of really interesting threads emerging in in, in your talk and, and and i suspect threads perhaps that are live in your own research at the moment there's clearly a huge amount of potential in the work you're doing thinking about representations of black children and stories around black children and this work on black authors in britain before 1950 so i think we'll be we'll be watching with great interest to see what's what's emerging from from those research areas one of the things that struck me that i was interested in um, in particular what was the advert you showed us what was it 4th of september 1707 for the runaway boy mm -hmm. and i'm really interested in you know where those kind of intersections are between local history and micro history and it just struck me that there's such a wonderful kind of micro history there in that short advert as you pointed out so much rich detail in the in the garments the marks on the body of that boy um so much that can be drawn out from that are there projects that are doing that kind of micro historical work with those uh, with those adverts is that what the glasgow project is doing is is that happening well, the Glasgow project has collected them, what it's going to do with them and how it's going to analyse them. Um, I, I await with critical interest. But Ben Marsh, who's at the University of Kent, together with Ben, we have written a, a, a chapter for a forthcoming book, quite a large book on Maritime Kent. And we look at the diversifying of Kent's history. And that advertisement is where we start. So what you were suggesting, we've attempted to do and to ask some of the serious questions about it and taking it through, but also looking at the way in which just this one maritime county um, was integrated with, I, I've drawn on it, obviously, for what I've been talking about, how it, it's integrated into a wider world with connections with the Chesapeake and Maryland and, and the Caribbean, as well as Africa and Asia. Mm. Um, Yes, everything is connected, whether those are comfortable connections yeah. or in some cases not, as, as, as you've highlighted. Thank you so much, um, David. Um, I think we've all learned a great deal from your talk. Um, there's lots, I think, um, that, that's forthcoming in your work that will await with great interest um, as well. Um, again, we show our appreciation um, for, for David for his contribution today. Um, if any more questions emerge, we may have time to, to return to them right at the end of today's session. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll thank you very much, uh, David, um, for, for your presentation today and, and your, your thoughtful responses to those questions. And we will move on to our final speaker today. Um, and our final speaker is my colleague Matt Shaw. He's the librarian of the Vol Library at the Institute of Historical Research. Um, Matt has been extremely busy recently, more busy than you might expect, given that the doors of the IHR are closed, because Matt and the IHR library team have been doing a huge amount to support researchers um, working within the history profession in all kinds of different contexts during this period of lockdown. We've all been facing unprecedented challenges, haven't we, um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of accessing archives and resources and library materials. So Matt and the library team have done a huge amount to um, support fellow historians. I've just pasted in the chat box the wonderful guide to open access online resources that they've made available on the IHR website. I'm sure Matt's probably going to speak to that in a moment. If you haven't found that, it's, it's really um, a, a must see at the moment. And I'm so grateful to Matt for joining us today to share some expert advice and guidance in his talk on research during lockdown, libraries and archives. Thank you very much, Matt. I'll hand over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, well, well, thank you for uh, letting me, um, uh, inviting me to speak at this um, wonderful conference. We're really fascinating to see all the work that people have been doing, um, also topical in, in very interesting ways. Um, hopefully you can all see my, my um, slideshow. Um, I'm going to talk 
oh, 10 minutes or so about um, some strategies, some of the context um, in terms of doing research at this time. Um, but I suspect you're all more expert than I am in many of these, these aspects. So I'd be really interested to hear what you um, have to say in the comments and indeed any suggestions you might have that we can share um, in the IHR library and through its website. Um, so I've started off here with a rather menacing set of um, um, American policemen of Seattle, I think, from that, the many uh, public health information slides and prints that were produced during the, uh, the Spanish flu. Um, and just a reminder of the many things that are there online. Um, and there are a couple of things about this image, which, which I'm going to talk about, which um, set some research in context. Um, again, you're all aware that things online, and of course things online, what everyone will be looking at at the moment, um, have their own history and it isn't always as apparent um, online as it is perhaps in an archive. Um, so these images and there are others around the web of um, nurses in America and so on um, are often used um, to illustrate the Spanish flu epidemic um, which is good and important um, but of course it doesn't really explain where the images came from, the fact that they were produced by the Red Cross, um, the fact that they are in um, American national and state archives so the copyright doesn't um, necessarily apply to them. Um, which is why they're used and it gives a particular image of, of the past. Um, but again, your historians, you'll know all that. Um, I thought that I'd, I'd start with uh, a bit more context as well. And again, you, I apologize, you will know all of this. Um, but one of the questions we get and one of the things we see online is why haven't the publishers who've scanned all these things and made them available, why don't they make them all freely available or why doesn't my local library, why doesn't my university, um, why doesn't the IHR have access to all these wonderful products which are available through Adam Matthews, ProQuest and Ancestry and many others. Um, and indeed there are a number of reasons for these. And of course copyright is perhaps one of the, the, the most important ones. The uh, people who scan the, these resources um, create a new, uh, creative work in many ways and uh, copyright is claimed on it and these things are very expensive to subscribe to. Um, if we wanted to subscribe to um, I don't know one of the, the more um, common kind of colonial papers or something like that the, the charge would be around £30,000 something like that and even more if we opened it up to more people. So these products are very expensive even uh, for, a, for a yearly subscription they are uh, not cheap. Um, and that reflects, to some extent, the amount of legwork that's involved in producing these, these online resources. They involve many people. They are things that take several years to make. Um, and the people investing the money in producing these things have to um, get their money back for their shareholders. Um, there are lots of uh, opinions on this. Um, you could argue that the uh, European continental European model is a better one in which the states really intervene and done these things on a massive scale like in France and Gallica um, but the route we've taken here is a mixed economy um, and this is kind of what we're, we're stuck with. The other aspect of course is the copyright and uh, if you're doing anything that is um, involved in the 19th century um, you're probably okay but as soon as we get into the 20th century the copyright issues of scanning and digitizing things are really really uh, tricky. Um, and if the copy, of course, um, is retained the 70 years after the death of the author, and that's published materials with exceptions like photographs and so on. Um, so, to, but, so to make sure the copyright is cleared for anything done in the 20th century is a really quite an onerous task. Um, manuscripts also, strictly speaking, if they're not published, are also in copyright in Britain until 2039, um, thanks to a, a strange change in the law a few years ago. So um, strictly speaking, um, if you've come across some um, Vinlandia tablet or something like that and it's not been published, it's still in copyright if you can chase, trace it down to the uh, Roman uh, ancestor today. Um, so that's to give some, some of the, um, the context and, and within that the universities and public libraries and research libraries, when they acquire things, um, there are very, very strict licensing um, requirements around that, which mean that um, only certain people, people who are members or certain types of readers um, can access these materials. Um, 
So that's the bad news. The good news, of course, is there's also been a very um, innovative and uh, wide ranging series of open access and freely accessible projects, many of which emerge from um, the local history world and um, the VCH in many ways is, is representative of that in the amount of stuff it makes makes available. Um, so that's the, uh, the downside. I'll go on to the slightly more positive stuff now. Um, well, I say slightly more positive, but um, really to give a bit more context, I suppose it's really some strategies and uh, and thoughts on 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 what the sector is doing. And maybe I should have started this with this. You'll have noticed that that libraries and archives are closed at the moment. Um, libraries are actually specifically listed in the government emergency legislation, and they are not allowed to open um, while the emergency persists. That may change. Um, there is some details in the legislation about remote access through um, postal or through scanning but again of course copyright comes into that um, and there are very um, onerous health and safety requirements in terms of putting staff back into buildings loan working actually physically getting to these places to make them open um, archives situation is slightly less clear in the legislation but it's um, very similar and the government is starting to offer up a bit more advice but it's still very unclear so you'll notice most of the libraries and archives have not given too much information um, and that's because the um, the playing field is really moving. We don't really know what the government is going to allow us to do and what's going to off what it, we can offer. Um, there is a lot going on. There are a lot of plans of what what can be done, and you'll have noticed places like the National Archives have begun to make digitization digital products available free. There are limits into what you can order. Um, I think it's fifty items within a thirty day period, but there are many details on their website about that. And they also give information about plans for reopening archives. Um, this is probably pretty technical and you won't need to know that, but it will, if you're interested in, interested in what your local archive is doing, it may help set the context and give you an idea of some of the issues they're facing um, and understand um, when they might open and in what form. Um, but I think um, it would be worth to bracing yourselves for quite a long period of closure for many repositories and archives. There'll be some sort of service, but many places are very small. It's very hard to get staff in. The buildings they are in, um, they tend not to own and it may depend on the leaseholder. So there could be issues there. Um, so again, I'm afraid it's probably bad news in general in terms of accessing the resources, but it's probably useful to know that this is what we are facing over the next year or so. So the good news, um, Catherine kindly mentioned the open and free access materials for research page, which um, the IHR library um, has created in partnership actually with colleagues in the Victoria County history here at, uh, at the IHR. Um, and also in partnership with, with many of you and many others. We, we have a, a form which you can get to through, um, through this page and um, the, uh, the, the, the link was in the, um, the group chat. Um, and we've asked people to just essentially send in um, resources that you know are useful and we've tried to categorize them in a, in a fairly um, free-flowing um, format um, but hopefully it gives an idea of the, the amount of material that is out there. It also leads you to various thematic guides and other more in-depth um, resources particularly um, organized by the Bodleian Library. They have a list of over a thousand online resources. Um, that's a lot to digest so we, th this page really is about a starting point and the idea is that initially it's at people who are doing MA type research dissertations but the resources will be um, useful for, for all um, and if you know of something that isn't there do, do let us know. There is a, a, a page here on um, local history um, there's the United, United Kingdom section and then a section um, on the other nation or the nations within the United Kingdom and then overseas local history as well um, which is quite extensive. Um, I'll just put the uh, exact link in the page although you can scroll down and see it um, and the idea it's a very simple sort of page it just gives a, a title of the resource a few notes and then a link to it and many of you will be familiar with many of these resources. Um, 
but it also perhaps will flag up some you don't know um, and it will also highlight some of the resources that publishers have made available such as um, the ones available through the National Archives and um, recently London Metropolitan Archives and Family History we were able to make some of their materials available and we hope and we'll be campaigning for um, more things to be made available even for a short time and then we can advertise it um, here it here as well so that's um, perhaps the one thing we'll flag up the um, um, resources the online um, freely available and open access resources on the IHR uh, website page um, and within that there are numerous resources such as the VCH ones I've mentioned but also British History Online which the IHR produces and um, includes a lot of material pertinent to local history and um, has opened up its um, sort of premium level of content including things like state papers um, so they are freely accessible and there's a very good text free text search of those resources as well they've all been rekeyed so they're very high quality um, um, primary sources um, the next sort of level of material of course is it's great getting hold of primary stuff and getting stuck into that but if you are stuck at home in lockdown how do you access um, materials so our guide actually does list the secondary resources as well um, the Internet Archive in America has opened up what is called the Emergency Public Library of America um, and it's even bigger than that title it's it's um, rough some publishers feathers because um, there are some copyright issues there which, which is infringed but it sees itself as a library and libraries of course allow people to borrow books and they've included uh, many volumes digitized by the Phillips Academy or held by the Phillips Academy and others. So this is over 2 million really quite interesting books up until about 1992 or thereabouts. So there's quite a, right, a wider range of materials than you might expect available online at the moment. JSTOR is perhaps one of the resources we get most requests for for people who don't um, have access to a university library. Um, it's a very expensive product, again, because it's so extensive and um, costs a lot to do and maintain and of course it's not for profit so they're not in theory making any money out of it but it, it's um, again quite a restricted license but they have made a lot of things available and are hosting a lot of resources available by American University Presses in particular University of Philadelphia and um, or Pennsylvania sorry and others are making all their content available through um, sites such as JSTOR and Project News um, but JSTOR is also allowing if you sign up for an individual account, just to sort of initially, it's a place to um, bookmark things. And uh, it used to allow you to consult 10 items in a month and have three on your shelf at any one time, I think. It's now letting you have 100 journal articles every month from across JSTOR, which is a, a quite a generous and useful um, access to secondary material. On there as well as an awful lot of open access material, which is material which the author um, has released into the world for free, um, retains the copyright, but has licensed it for people to use it. Um, and there's also an increasing amount of primary source material as well. So it's worth having a look, a look at that. So JSTOR, our, our flag up and Project News is it, its partner. Those of you who've got a British Library card, you may want to know about the um, British Library remote e-resources um, content. Um, which is there's less on Britain but there's a lot of American stuff but also some newspapers from uh, South America um, and uh, a lot of the newspaper materials from the Americas and indeed the Caribbean reprint a lot of British news and local news in those newspapers so it's another sneaky way of getting access to um, um, uh, 19th century content. Um, the other place worth looking at of course is your local library they may well sign up to Ancestry.com. They will probably have Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and other resources as well, um, just for your local library card. And most libraries will also let you sign up for free online. Um, that goes for the Guildhall Library, which will issue an emergency um, library card at the moment too. Um, the Hathi Trust is probably worth knowing about. I flagged this up because um, you're all probably familiar with Google Books, um, which is a great resource, um, but I would, I would recommend familiarising yourself with the Hattie Trust or the Hathi Trust, um, which is sort of a, um, a union catalogue of all the collections which Google have digitised um, and then some. Um, depending on your institution, you get extra rights to see things, but even if you're not a member of an institution, you get an awful lot of access to things. 
Google Books is a wonderful resource, of course, for searching all sorts of things, um, but the cataloging, the bibliographic data isn't uh, always the best. Um, so happy to trust mar marries up those digital files, sometimes in higher quality than on Google Books as well, um, with a catalog and full text searching, allowing you to find things um, much more easily than um, you might do in Google Books. So I'd recommend just familiarizing yourself with that. Um, and then I thought I'd reflect briefly on sort of the shape of things to come. Um, this is an app which comes on the scene called Sorcery, um, which is a project coming out of, if I remember rightly, Milwaukee, um, maybe somewhere else in the States. Um, but it, is, 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 it began before the coronavirus crisis, but it reflects on the fact that there are many people, graduate students who live near archives, who are in archives, and then many people who are a long way away from them. And normally people post on Twitter or social media or, or email, could somebody just check that resource for me? Um, this in theory uh, creates a, uh, cuts out the middle, middle person, um, and the app allows you to request things either for, for a small fee or, or perhaps for free if you do send the return, people will search the archive and they have, um, they collaborate with the archives as well. So there is a, um, some sort of um, official approval for this process as well and they understand copyright and uh, camera implications. The idea is this is gonna be rolled out to Britain as well. Um, and it could well be that um, these sorts of tools develop over the next um, year or so. Um, as people find it hard to travel, archives have limited opening hours, the uh, financial uh, crisis I suspect is coming, meaning that there are also hits to the bottom line of archives and services they can offer. And it might also be interesting to think about the other ways in which local historians might be able to share information and sources amongst themselves. Um, so again, it's sorcery. Um, dot, um, if you just Google it, 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 will, it will come up. Um, and then finally, um, there is also the, this seems to be the time for taking a step back and thinking about the work that we are doing and why one is doing it. Um, and of course, recent events that remind us of the importance of history and local history and the meaning of local history and its connections to community. So that may possibly change the sort of research one wants to do, and that may not need a vast amount of um, archival resource across a wide range of things. Maybe now is the time for slower, closer reading of fewer, um, perhaps less um, less looked at resources and a different sort of uh, approach to, to accessing materials. Um, and the image here is, is a paper written by Andrew Prescott and Lorna Hughes to um, sort of digital humanists uh, up in Glasgow. Um, reflecting on, on what happens when we digitize something and indeed when the researcher accesses that material for digitization. Um, there is a tendency to access many, 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 many things and whiz through things as fast as we can and get as many different things as, as we can. Um, but perhaps there's, there's something to be gained for taking a very slow, careful read of things online. And the people digitizing things might want to carefully, slowly digitize things um, they start off talking about how you can digitize Beowulf and of course we know how important it is to record the stitch marks and the wormholes and so on in terms of dating and uh, um, ideas about how it was used and so on. But that also applies to um, the images I mentioned at the start of those police people. Um, why were those policemen, why were they digitized? What uses were they made? How have they been preserved? What images were thrown away? Those sorts of questions. Um, Something else which is coming up, and I'm sort of drawing to an end now. Um, on the 19th of November this year, normally History Day, which I hope you've heard of, is which is an event which we which takes place in Senate House, a partnership between the IHR and Senate House Library, um, which brings together 60 and more repositories from across London and beyond, um, small archives, large archives, um, the John Ryland's um, Library and others, uh, the Black Cultural Archives. Um, and it's a chance to speak to a librarian and archivist and art librarians and archivists to speak to to one another. Um, we suspect it can't happen physically this year, it's too much of a risk, but we are going to go online, which provides a lot of opportunities, particularly for smaller archives um, who find it hard to staff these stools, but they can sit at home or in their archive and, and host a short tour of their resources. 
um, but also have a sort of ask me anything question. So it's a real opportunity to speak to archivists. Um, and then that's my, my, my final point, I suppose. Um, do, do sign up for history day at london.ac.uk to find out more about it. Um, and do seize this opportunity to um, send emails to librarians and archivists who are there. Um, we are very busy trying to arrange electronic resources and plan what the return to the libraries is, uh, would look like, but we are also very keen to answer inquiries as much as we can and maybe hunt out digital resources for you. So um, we are on um, IHR, I'll put it in the, in the uh, Um, there's our email in, in the chat um, and we will be happy to answer inquiries. Um, the only caveat of course is many archivists and archives are furloughed at the moment um, so there may be a delay um, that may change by October. Um, that's just something to, to, something to be aware of. Um, okay that, that's my talk. Um, thank you for listening and uh, um, yeah and thank you for taking part in this really interesting uh, mini conference. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Um, I'm, I'm doing a, a virtual clap right now. Um, uh, what a, a practical, useful, really helpful um, talk. Um, loads of really, really valuable pointers um, for us. If you want to, yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen and we can see um, more of our participants back on the screen uh, now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there'll be questions um, for Matt, perhaps pointers um, that you might be able to give on particular areas that people need help with. What I would like to highlight, and you might have seen these popping up during your talk, Matt, is people have generously been sharing lots of tips in the chat box. Um, new resources are being made available. Several initiatives from BAL, British Association for Local History, so all issues of the local historian, now available online, free to access. Um, the wonderful BAL 10 minute talks online that are I think an initiative since lockdown from the VCH as well. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that we've tried to make our resources available in new ways during lockdown. Obviously much VCH content is already freely available on British history online um, but we've also um, put out a special offer on our VCH shorts in their ebook form 149. I'm afraid that was the cheapest we could we were allowed to do it. We weren't allowed to put it at zero. It's a contractual thing um, but trying to make resources um, available. Um, Chris, uh, Christopher notes that lots of county archaeological societies have their own journals available on their websites. Um, lots of suggestions here. So thanks for your generosity, everyone. And there might be things there for, for Matt and the team to incorporate into that um, online list of resources. Does anyone have any specific questions for Matt about something they're stuck on, you know, help with a particular challenge with accessing resources and materials at the moment? If not, I might spring a really horrendous, horrible question on you, Matt, which kind of comes back to something you did touch on a little bit in your talk, which is sort of what's going to change long term for us. So in terms of libraries and archives, in terms of the work that we all do as researchers, in terms of the academic publishing industry, I'm asking you to be a soothsayer now, aren't I? But do you have a sense of the longer term changes we should be anticipating out of this? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. We actually have a, a workshop next week, um, which is available to all people to participate in on the 18th of Ju uh, June, so it's signed up on the IHR website, looking at, at these these questions. Um, and yeah, that, that there will clearly be some interesting things, good things that come out of this time. Um, the ability to do sessions like this, to do online training, um, will be really, uh, should continue. The ability to, um, surface resources through crowdsourcing like we're doing now and like we're doing for these other resources um, and some other interesting projects which I hope to announce soon um, will be really helpful. Um, I think people will also be wary of or curious about how they travel and, and so on and the time they involve they've they take and invest in researching and, and think about slightly other and more green and uh, carbon neutral ways of doing those sorts of um, 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 research trips. Um, and I think the other thing that's been really interesting is I know that um, sometimes libraries and archives feel themselves as a bit of a Cinderella service in universities and local authorities. Um, and it's very interesting that 
we were the last things to close in many places or the buildings to close anyway. Um, it's been reminded how much libraries and archives are needed and appreciated. Um, I don't know if that will translate into more money or, or not, but I think it, it should do and uh, people will hopefully be lobbying for those, those sorts of things. Um, I think also the costs of electronic resources and the fact that um, some places haven't invested in them and have limited it to certain people who are either students or can afford these things. Um, there's a real digital divide and there will be hopefully um, some campaigns to, to change that. Um, there might be more stuff made available in open access and digital, digitally by default, which of course has its drawbacks in terms of, you know, print stuff is nice. Um, but the, the, the practical benefits of digital materials is perhaps outweigh them. Um, and I think there are also going to be some rather tricky consequences. Publishers are going to find this next period really difficult. Um, local bookshops are going to find this very tricky. Um, and um, local councils and so on are going to find it very hard to find the money to continue to pay for um, local um, libraries and archives and so on. So I think there may be some tricky things on that front. Um, mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep, keep, yeah, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thanks for those insights, um, Matt. And um, uh, yeah, other people, Alex, sharing, sharing comments, lots of insights there in, in the chat box as well. I was struck by what you said about History Day going online this year. And, you know, for, for lots of us today, you know, in this, in this event, we're getting to grips with quite an unfamiliar um, digital uh, system. But I think for a lot of our BCH community, History Day being online is actually great in terms of accessibility. And, you know, we have people working on the BCH up in, you know, Durham and Cumbria and all, all parts of the country. And as we all know, it can be difficult to get into London for the day. So I, I'd like to think that now that we've discovered these digital ways of bringing people together, these virtual ways of connecting us up, we, we might be able to do more of that in future even when we don't have to or at least think in kind of blended ways both in terms of our research but also in terms of our uh, our interaction with each other I guess. Yeah definitely I hope so I mean the fact that um, so many things that actually take place in libraries and archives discussions or writing sessions or workshops and training sessions can really work quite nicely online and, and are so much more accessible um, for people who find it hard to travel or um, and can be international. It's been real, well, it's things we've sort of you know, been aware of in the past, but there's never really been the, the urgency to do them. And uh, the urgency has given us um, a good incentive and reason to do these things. So I think there are, as, as I think you're suggesting, there are some exciting opportunities there, as well as some daunting challenges and impacts that will be with us um, for a long time. Thank you so much, Matt. And I'm really glad to see that Matt's talk has prompted this really generous sharing of um, uh, URLs and tips and resources in the chat box which is brilliant and I'm really grateful to Matt for sharing the IHR library email address in the chat box and I do know that Matt and the team will, will do everything they can do to, to help researchers with that proviso of um, you know staffing um, being under a bit more pressure at the moment. Um, so thank you so much Matt for your, your presentation and your help and um, I'm going to move towards kind of drawing the event to a close now. So first of all, I want to thank all our speakers. Um, can we thank all of our speakers again, please? Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, this has been a first for many of us or, or doing something a little bit new. Um, and we're really grateful to, to everyone's willingness to embrace this new technology, particularly, particularly the speakers who are under that extra pressure, I think, today. This is also a really nice opportunity opportunity for me to extend my thanks to our VCH, our Victoria County History team across England for all that you do. I can see lots of, of familiar names and faces here today. Um, it's great to have this virtual opportunity to draw us together. Thank you for everything you're doing, particularly during these very difficult circumstances um, at the moment. We'd be really grateful if you could share your feedback on today's event. You can do that either by typing into the chat box, you can address it to everyone, or if you want to be a, a a little bit less public you can just just address it um, to me uh, we'll also follow up by email and there'll be a chance to share feedback then we've recorded this session and we will make it available on the center for the history of people place and community website in our events archive 
In fact, if you go there, there's already a recording of another online event that we ran. That was an online engagement masterclass with our colleagues from Layers of London, which we ran last week. A really useful resource, I think, for if you're looking at how you might take some of your Victoria County history engagement and volunteer work and crowdsourcing into an online format. So we will upload this here. We'll also collate all the uh, wonderful tweets that we've seen going on during this session. Great that there's been a parallel and really lively conversation online too. We've got various future virtual events planned, both in the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community and at the IHR. You've heard Matt refer to a few already. We're also planning an online Victoria County History training programme. I know we've, we've had a, a chat with a few of you already about that and that will have a focus on skills and training for local historians. Those will be open sessions. I'm really hoping again that this virtual technology will make it easier for people to access that training. Um, and we're looking at being able to involve some um, uh, really expert figures in that. So do stay in touch, watch this space. So I think that's everything that I wanted to share, just to thank everyone again for participating today. We hope very much to see you at another Centre for the History of People, Place and Community or VCH or IHR event online again in the future. Um, I'm going to ask our um, local IHR team and our speakers just to, to hang on once everyone else has left so we can just have a, a very quick debrief. Um, but to everyone else, thank you so much for joining us and uh, goodbye. Bye.